After the development of the microscope, later came the development of what is called uh, the cell theory. And I'd like to walk you through this process because it's an interesting demonstration of how science operates. You see, previous to this, people used to believe in a thing called spontaneous generation. And that was the idea that life would just spontaneously emerge from non-living matter. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, some people even published recipes. For example, here's one here by Dr. Jan Baptista von Helmont about a recipe for creating mice. And he said, to take a bunch of dirty shirts and rags and a, and a bunch of wheat and put them all together in a corner somewhere in your barn and let them sit for 21 days and lo and behold you're going to get mice. Now you and I might look at this and say uh, well of course I mean, mice are going to move in and eat the wheat sort of thing and little mice have babies mice but they actually thought that you could create life spontaneously from non-living things and they had no way f of proving it wrong. Until a little later on, a fellow by the name of Francesco Reddy did this experiment with, uh, with rotting meat in 1668. He had a jar with a piece of rotting meat in it, and he left the jar open, and he noticed that uh, flies would get in and you'd have maggots appearing on the meat. Well, then he took the same jar with some meat in it, and he put a cork in it. And when he stuck a cork in this jar, lo and behold, the, the meat never showed any maggots. Uh, if he put a piece of gauze cloth on the top of the jar. He noticed that the flies would certainly try to get at the meat, like it seems like they could smell its odor, and they would certainly lay their eggs on the top, uh, but if the gauze was fine enough, you wouldn't get any maggots inside the meat. And so he proposed that, uh, you know, you can't make uh, flies from nothing. That they're getting in and they're, they're laying their eggs on the meat or whatever else it is that's rotting, and that's where you're getting your maggots from. But people still had their doubts. So, Further experimentation was done. A couple of guys called Needham and Spallanzani, they get into the act, and they were using uh, beef broth. And so the, one of the experiments that Needham did here is he, he took some broth and he heated it up and he allowed it to cool, but notice he left the flask open. And sure enough, uh, you, you do that, you're going to get bacteria growing inside the flask, no problem. And then he did the same thing where he heated up the broth. Um, he sealed up the flask, he stuck a cork in it, and he noticed that uh, when you leave the cork in there, nothing grows. Uh, but if you take the cork off, then sure enough, the broth gets spoiled and you get bacteria in there. Spallanzani did sort of like the same kind of thing. He would heat up the broth in both of his experiments here, um, and then he would allow them to cool off. And, and one he would leave open and one he would leave corked. And the one that was open, of course, would grow bacteria in it, and the one that was left sealed didn't grow any bacteria in it. Uh, but really, nobody had conclusively proved how this actually worked, and bacteria were awfully hard to see with the microscopes of the day. Then along comes Louis Pasteur, and finally we have somebody who uses some genuine scientific method here. Uh, Louis did what nobody else did. He actually used a pr proper program of scientific investigation. He developed a glass flask that had this strange-looking uh, gooseneck in it, and so he heated up his, uh, his flask and boiled it to kill any pre-existing microorganisms. So if there was anything inside that broth, he first off killed it or sterilized it by using a lot of heat. And what he did was he left it and it would cool and condensation would form this water barrier inside the gooseneck. And what that barrier did was it prevented bacteria from sneaking into the broth. Now, he could prove this by if he broke that gooseneck off, then for sure bacteria got in, you would ruin the broth, and he demonstrated that uh, microorganisms were the ones responsible for causing this to occur. So what he did that was so different was this, and you're going to learn about this in your science course, and you need to understand this as well. He worked with three different variables. Now a variable is something which can be changed in an investigation. First off, we have the controlled variables. So Louis Pasteur was very careful to make sure that he used the same type of flask, the same kind of broth, the same amount of light, the same amount of temperature. In other words, he made absolutely sure that the conditions under which the experiment was performed were absolutely identical. And the only thing he changed was, was one thing, and that was this. Did dust have access to this flask? Yes or no. That was it. There were no other possibilities. He took care of everything else and brought it down to just this one manipulated variable. So a manipulated variable is the variable that you change as the experiment. It, it comes from the word manus, which is the Latin word for hand.
And so what you're doing here, you are manipulating or you are deciding what it is we're going to investigate here. And in this case, is it can dust get to the flask, yes or no? Now, in response to that, you then get what's called a responding variable, which is, did mold grow, yes or no? So we have a controlled variable, controlled conditions, one manipulated variable, and remember, you can only manipulate one variable at a time, so you must isolate the manipulated variable by itself. And then you get a response to what you manipulated, and hopefully from that, you can come up with a valid conclusion. And that's exactly what Louis Pasteur did. He proved conclusively once and for all the presence of bacteria sneaking into food and ruining it. Later on, at about the same time in the 1830s, a number of fellows got involved in developing the, the cell theory. And these guys were Robert Brown, Matthias Schladen, Theodore Schwann, and Rudolf Virchow. Between the work of these gentlemen, they finally boiled it down to these three things. So no longer do we talk about spontaneous generation and making life from non-life. These fellows came up with these points. That is, all living things are made up of one or more cells. So if it's alive and you look at it under a microscope, you will see that it is made up of at least one, and usually, if it's a multicellular creature, a whole lot more cells. They also said all life functions occur in cells. They are the smallest unit of life. So basically, everything that we need to have take place, all the chemical reactions that are required, occur inside of our cells. And lastly, they said, all cells are produced from pre-existing cells through the process of cell division, which means that you cannot get cells spontaneously erupting out of inanimate matter. And this basically put to rest with the work of these gentlemen and the previous work done by people like Louis Pasteur. This finally put to rest the whole notion of spontaneous generation.